Hi, I'm Kate Kirkpatrick. I'm a lecturer in philosophy, religion and culture at King's College London. Uh, and my primary areas of research are the philosophy of religion and existentialism. Um, and I'm especially interested in the intersection of religious questions with the uh, philosophical questions that were being debated in French philosophy in the second quarter of the 20th century. What does Beauvoir teach us? What does Beauvoir teach us? Uh, quite a lot. Um, I think the most important theme that runs throughout her works is um, that becoming an ethical self involves uh, having the kind of right balance between prioritizing uh, the needs of others and recognizing um, uh, a certain kind of uh, one's own needs as an important aspect of that. So, yeah. um, where do her theories sit in relation to her existentialist contemporaries? So there are many things that Beauvoir shares with her existentialist contemporaries, um, partly as a feature of having learned philosophy in France. Um, the syllabus uh, for the aggregation in philosophy in the period in which Beauvoir was learning was something that uh, everyone had to learn together. Um, so she shares certain uh, concerns with the concept of freedom. Uh, this is something we see in her earliest uh, surviving notebooks. Um, and so she's, she's wrestling with the questions of what it means to be free and to value one's freedom, but also to value the freedoms of others. Um, so, I mean, one of the things that makes Beauvoir's philosophy so interesting is that it's constantly in conversation with her contemporaries and with philosophers of the past. Uh, and it's one, this is one of the things also that's shaped her reception as honestly uh, in Sartre's shadow philosophically because she wasn't translated into English um, and when she was translated into English uh, she was often only translated partially or without the philosophical rigor that was in the original French text. Really? So when did full translations of her work come, come through in, in, into English? Uh, well, full translations are not yet available. Um, so the there's been a great scholarly effort uh, through the Beauvoir Research Series which is published by the University of Illinois Press um, over the last couple of decades and there's um, uh, so, but even The Second Sex which is the book that she's most famous for was um, translated uh, without a very philosophical approach um, and published in 1953 and that translation shaped the reception of Beauvoir in the English speaking world until um, 2009 when a new translation appeared. Um, the first one actually only included about 85% of the original French text. It excluded her discussion of housework. It excluded a lot of discussions of um, how women in their own voice. Um, so it was, it was whatever the intentions of the translator, uh, the, the message of the book was quite altered uh, by the translation it had at first in English. And even in French-speaking countries with French texts, um, there was presumably still this uh, presumption that Beauvoir relied on Sartre uh, or like that, that um, she was shaped by her partner in, in philosophically. Yes, now I wouldn't deny that she was shaped by her partner philosophically, but I think the problem is that um, the, that kind of admission usually only goes one way and Sartre's philosophy was very much shaped by her commitments and her questions and her challenges to what uh, he published. The pr but the problem is that because um, Beauvoir wasn't translated until much later, what came into English was a lot of Sartre's philosophy and her contributions to the to French existentialism uh, were widely overlooked, especially in the, in the popular sphere. So. Do you think time lags like that, which have a big impact on public perception are gone now in a digital age? Do you think that could happen again? Uh, well, I haven't yet seen a couple that has a contender for Sartre and Beauvoir in, as public intellectuals. Uh, in, in, um, but I think translation is still very difficult to achieve um, and it's, it seems to be the case that it's fewer women are translated than men. Um, and so I think, it, you know, the times have changed, but I'm not convinced that they've changed as much as they need to where spreading women's work, um, women's intellectual work, uh, is acknowledged as it should be. So. Okay. Um, so why 
decide to write about Beauvoir's life rather than about her writing? So the decision to write about her life was not an easy one to make. Um, but one of Beauvoir's uh, points in the second sex is that um, women are often uh, judged as successes or failures on the basis of their romantic life. Uh, they're often reduced to their romantic lives. Um, and what, what I have found partly through my research on Sartre, because I worked on Sartre before Beauvoir, uh, was that there were a lot of French philosophical sources informing his early philosophy that English speakers didn't know about, and so they didn't kind of hear the conversations that he was having with the French philosophical tradition in texts like Being and Nothingness. Um, and when I read Beauvoir's student diaries, uh, which cover the period from 1926 to 1930, um, which importantly includes a few years before Sartre was even in the picture, I found that she was preoccupied by themes that would later be called existentialist before she even met him, uh, and that they were reading many of the same neglected sources. And so the idea that these ideas uh, were his in the first place was problematic. Um, and once I started to look at the way Beauvoir described their relationship uh, in the different volumes of her autobiography, which was published over 12 years between 1958 and 1972, um, I saw that she had noticed the way her successes were attributed to Sartre. So she was called Sartre's disciple. She was uh, accused of popularizing his ideas. Um, she didn't live to see the obituary that called her as imaginationless as her inkwell, but she lived to see a lot of reviews of her books where um, the content of her novels or her, her philosophical works were attributed to Sartre, and she was just uh, called effectively a good communicator. That's what women are good at, communicating, not thinking. They just know how to, once someone else has done the thinking, to communicate it well. Um, so once I saw that pattern emerge in uh, the reception of her works, I became e extremely suspicious of a lot of the existing scholarly literature about Beauvoir in English. And I thought, what happens if we read the rest of her life on the basis of the philosophy that she was developing as a young woman? Um, and I found that there's a lot of continuity there and that um, Sartre has been given way more credit than he deserves. <laughs> um, yes. Sounds like a good decision then. Um, yes. So speaking maybe a bit more about her philosophy, what might Beauvoir say about contemporary discourses surrounding issues like gender identity and biological essentialism? Yeah, so she clearly rejects biological essentialism, but uh, that term has taken on many meanings in the contemporary context, which were not uh, necessarily present in the same senses in 1949. Um, and one of the, th one of the um, interesting things about the second sex now is that many people think on the basis of its most famous sentence um, where Beauvoir says that one is born, well, sorry, one is not born but rather becomes a woman, uh, that she's denying the relevance of uh, anatomy to what it means to be a woman. Um, but that sentence actually is a uh, almost verbatim quotation from a French philosopher who wrote about the freedom and determinism debate in the the late 1890s called Alfred Fouillet uh, and he said that one is not born but rather becomes free and Beauvoir was an existentialist philosopher who was committed to the idea um, that freedom is something uh, that you constantly have to strive for in your life um, and the uh, she thought that women were not encouraged to pursue their own values and to pursue their own freedom in the same ways that men were um, as a as a result of childhood. So she says in The Second Sex, what she's trying to, to investigate is what humanity has made of the human female. And she thinks that culture and childhood play a really important role in uh, the oppression of women um, and even the feelings of division and dissatisfaction that women have within themselves. Um, how about then existentialism and feminism? Are they compatible? Yes, Beauvoir's existentialism is very much compatible with her feminism. And I think one of the things um, that I find fascinating as a philosopher is how um, she, did not, she did not write The Second Sex as an activist book. So there's a 1975 interview where Beauvoir says she wrote it as a theoret theoretical work 
and she was surprised by the activist role that it went on to play. Um, there's a lot of uh, philosophical work happening in this in the second sex, uh, but but one of the things that I think is so interesting is that she's looking at the challenges that existentialists in general are concerned with about how you become a self, or how you become an ethical self, uh, and she's saying there are challenges confronting women in becoming ethical selves which are not identical to the challenges confronting men um, and so I think they're compatible and part of uh, the work of the second sex is to show how. Okay cool and um, I think it's probably implicit but um, how relevant is she and her philosophy today? <laughs> So, I mean, I have been, this, this, my biography of Beauvoir has been out for a month tomorrow, and I have been astonished by uh, the, the number of people who have said to me um, how much it spoke into the present situation. So I think there are strong progress narratives in feminism and a tendency to think that women of a generation before or two generations before uh, are no longer relevant. But there are some questions in human life like um, how to love ethically and what it means uh, to become yourself given certain constraints that just don't date. And I think Beauvoir is a philosopher who spoke to those.